if you mess up. Apologize and get over yourself because it's your issue, not theirs. Um, okay. Yeah, the more you, the more you backpedal and, and apologize and over apologize, the more that that trust level, that ability to, to repair the broken circle, that circle of security starts to increase and widen, right? So that trust level starts to lower itself down the more you apologize because now you're no longer making it about the patient, you're making it about your own mistake and you're taking the focus off of them and onto you. Welcome to In the ED Now, a podcast that makes you an excellent emergency department physical therapist. I'm your host, Dr. Rebecca Griffith, the ED DPT. In today's episode, we talk with Dr. Stephanie Barassa, who is a physical therapist in Connecticut. Her practice area is primarily sports physical therapy, but today she talks to us about LGBTQ health and disparities and how to be aware of those in the emergency department, how to make tweaks to your practice so that you aren't causing any disparities, and how to best interact with patients so that they have a trauma-informed approach that keeps them safe and well and in access to healthcare. Thanks for listening. You're in the ED now. All right, welcome to the show. We're in the ED now, and I'm here this morning with Dr. Stephanie Barrasso. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Exciting. It's so nice to have you here, and you are not an emergency department PT, so we'll just preface it with that. Can you share a little bit about your story? Sure. So I'm a sports medicine physical therapist. Uh, I run the sports medicine program for uh, a healthcare system in the state of Connecticut. And uh, I started my journey as a uh, as a history major in college, uh, but I tore my ACL, MCL, and meniscus and, uh, you know, spent more time with the physical therapist than I spent in the classroom. And, and here we are. And here we are. And so you were a D1 athlete, yeah? I was a D1 athlete. Yeah, I played soccer. Um, You know, my career uh, started in the Olympic development program, played uh, throughout that whole system. And my day before making it to the big leagues as a a senior uh, senior player, uh, the day before I I hurt my knee. And um, but it's okay because I uh, was able to play my collegiate career. And now I set my standards at taking care of athletes and making sure that we take care of them a, a holistic way. I love that. I think that's probably important. I am not like a huge athletic person. I never was an athlete, so I don't have a ton of experience with that. I am one of the least coordinated humans probably on the planet. But I, as an emergency PT, I can appreciate what you do because we do see a lot of athletes that come yeah. in with injuries. And I would argue that if you're a sports PT, you, you are kind of an emergency PT, just maybe not practicing in the emergency department. Yeah, actually, I have my acute illness and injury medicine uh, or medication certification from a management perspective. Um, Most people know it as emergency response for the athlete. So uh, a lot of my time is spent on the sidelines, triaging and helping the athletic trainers with with acute injury and illnesses. Um, You know, I spend and volunteer my time at the Marine Corps Marathon and sometimes the Boston Marathon and with our our own Hartford Marathon series. And um, so, yeah, I definitely respond in in acute and uh, in some significant uh, injury responses. So I get it. Yeah, definitely a first responder versus a first receiver, right? Which is what yeah. the emergency department would be. So, yeah. but we're not talking about any of that today. No, we're not. <laughs> so what are we going to talk about? Yeah, I think we're going to talk about some uh, some LGBTQ health disparities. Uh, you know, my, my a lot of my work is around the transgender athlete, um, mm-hmm. but I've been presenting nationally at multiple conferences about the, these health disparities and how physical therapists and physical therapist assistants can approach uh, approach that care with a, a little bit more of a trauma informed care or uh, with a hat that helps to develop a rapport better and, and really gets the, the patients invested in our time and in our energy to make them feel better. I think there are so many ways in our healthcare system where we are not able to provide patient-centered care because we truly, this is one of my biggest soapboxes, provide payer-centered care. Mm-hmm. And But I feel like this is an opportunity for us to truly inject more patient-centeredness into our approach. And if you are practicing in the emergency department, you will see patients who are part of that LGBTQ plus population. Mm-hmm. And so the reason that I want to talk to you is mm-hmm. we need to be better at that. So I think maybe the first question that I have for you are what are the common health disparities? Because I think those of us who are maybe not part of that community have no idea. Like we really don't know what we don't know. And maybe we hear things like, oh, there's discrimination or things like that. But how does that really translate to health outcomes? Because I think people miss that. And that's the piece that I want to start with is what are the health disparities that you've seen? What are what does the literature show and what do we need to be aware of? 
Yeah, so um, there's actually some pretty staggering statistics. Um, there's a higher rate of homelessness. There's a higher rate of, of underinsured or, or no insurance at all. Um, you know, oftentimes uh, LGBTQ community members will go two plus years of not ever seeing a primary care physician or a primary care provider for, for any of their care. Um, and primarily that's because they've they've uh, more than likely experienced discrimination. Um, I mean, there's some staggering statistics and research about how many uh, care providers have donned full PPE in order to interact with individuals from the what? LGBTQ. Yeah, no. like full gown, full mask, full face shield, gloves, um, just this, this entering the room for just a checkup. Um, you know, a, a blood pressure monitoring and, and just to kind of go over some blood labs. And um, so that's really some some staggering statistics. And, and you can see why there's this distrust. Um, yeah. You know, I looked at, at the, the black community members and, and they have a similar distrust. And by means, no means is it comparative because um, there's some significant health disparities within that community as well. But the LGBTQ is is, is definitely in that, that era. Um, there's a lot of misconceptions about the fact that um, LGBTQ tend to have a higher uh, hepatitis rate and, and mm. HIV rate. And there's this misconception that it's because of choosing to have intercourse with same-sex partners. Um, but it actually has more to the to the fact that they can't afford some of their medications. And so they turn to the streets uh, to get some of those medications. Mm. And so now you have uh, the cost of needles, the cost of medication and some sharing that happens, um, especially with that, that homelessness. Um, and then we don't even know as much about the literature about the aging population because we don't ask those kinds of questions on research, right? Oh. So, so we're just starting to identify that individuals that are in that, that 50, 60 plus range um, are uh, two times as likely to, to be alone, two times as likely to live without, uh, you know, a partner or a significant other. Um, they're more than likely to not be out to their family and friends in, in some of that community. And they're three times as likely to not have children. So then when we talk about the total joint population and those that, you know, there's this push to, to go home on same day surgery, right, mm -hmm. for total joints. Um, and there's this push away from skilled nursing facilities and assisted care. And, and many of these individuals are, are um, you know, disregarded because they're just like, well, you're, you're young enough, you should be able to go home, but they don't really have that support system. And so yes. we've been working a lot with our physicians to encourage more conversations around that, like find out the why, be a little more curious and supportive. And um, so th there's been some good learning opportunities. Okay, so other than not just being like a total not great human being, <laughs> like putting on PP, I mean, if we, people don't want you to yeah. wear a mask for COVID, but you need to put on a mask to take somebody's blood pressure. I can't even. Yeah. That. But so, what is the best approach? Because when I look at a chart, for example, in the yeah. emergency department, none of nothing, none of that is usually in there. Like I usually have maybe one note and maybe there's some past medical history and maybe there's nothing. Maybe it's like yeah. patient present, patient film. Like it, that yeah. might be all it says. And yeah. I might know that the patient is a uh, 55 year old woman who fell down the stairs. That may be all I know. So I'm not going yeah. in there with any preconceived notions or, or any like Biases thoughts there. about yeah. that. So yeah. yep. how do, also, like, I don't want to ask the wrong questions. Like, I'm just gonna be honest. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know what to do to make sure. sure that I'm not causing a health disparity here. Yeah. So there's there's lots of ways that you could you can minimize some of that and, and and promote a better entry system into the healthcare system, especially seeing them in the emergency department. Um, you might be their last resort. They're coming in because something's going on, and you might yes. be the first provider that has seen them in two three years. Um, some of the, this population travels up to four hours to see some of their primary care providers wow. because they just finally find somebody that treats them like a human being and, and then they go and find them. So the very first thing you could do is, is introduce with your pronouns. Um, that very first thing of, you know, hi, I'm Dr. Barassa. I prefer she, her as my pronouns. Um, you will see the layers just come off of an individual if you use that, that pronoun, those pronoun in introductions. Now, all of a sudden, they're like, okay, this person actually understands the gender spectrum that I'm on um, or my sexual orientation spectrum that I might be, be experiencing. Um, and you'll be surprised at how much they go, you know, thank you. Um, I prefer they, them. I prefer she, her. Um, I prefer she, they. And, and you know what? And you might see them three months from now in the emergency department again um, and reintroduce with your pronouns because it might change. Um, and, and that's that, that spectrum. Um, the other thing that you could do is, is have, you know, safe space lanyards 
rainbows, the sign mm -hmm. of the flag, the transgender flag, the, you know, the LGBTQ flag, um, anywhere on your badge, on, on a lanyard, um, you know, the, oftentimes that symbol to individuals helps them to, to recognize that you might have done some trauma-informed care training mm -hmm. or some safe space training. Um, and so now all of a sudden, um, you're able to, to have a better conversation. Um, the other questions that you, you don't really need to ask is, um, don't ask anything that doesn't pertain to what you're seeing them for. Um, right. You know, so you know, you don't need to know their sexual preferences um, if they're coming in for a wrist sprain or a wrist injury, right? You don't really need to know that. Um, no, it would be a weird, weird thing to ask. It would be a weird thing to ask. But you might need to know that about um, if they're coming in with, with low back pain um, yes. because how that happens and some, some education surrounding some safe practices might need to come into play or to identify that the pelvic floor is involved. Yeah, go ahead. You have I, some I, I, I actually do talk to people about sex a lot in the yeah. emergency department. So I think that's a thing that, oh, that, that's probably a whole nother podcast mm -hmm. episode is how do you yeah. talk to your patients about sex in the emergency <laughs> department? Because I see people with hip dislocations after yeah. intercourse. I see people with low back pain and I find that they're not often forthcoming with the provider that sees yep. them before me. Let's say, oh, I was lifting something or I was mm -hmm. rolling over in bed. But then when they're talking to me, they're like, oh, well, this is what happened. Yeah. And, uh, you know, when I was teaching somebody posterior hip precautions they're like okay but like how am I supposed to have intercourse now so it does mm -hmm. happen more often than not is there yeah. like a a professional way to just approach that conversation I find is just asking and listening do you have yep. any other suggestions yeah um the the key question is oftentimes well what does intercourse mean to you Ooh. um yeah that. so that that's an open-ended question it allows for them to gauge their comfort level. Uh, it also kind of identifies that you understand that it's more than just the typical heterosexual intercourse, right? Okay. Um, and it might mean, you know, just because they, they might be sexually active, it might not be any penetrative um, aspects of, of intercourse. It might okay. be, um, you know, so you, you do just that. What does inter intercourse mean to you is, is a good open-ended question for that. I love that. That is yeah. very helpful. Okay. Yeah. And what um, else? Listen, what, like, what are other yeah. disparities that, like, I want to make sure that my patients are getting the best care and that I am sure. aware of things that, that that might be an issue? Um, high amount of suicide ideation, oh, okay. um, especially as youth population, yes. um, you know, um, 33 to 66 percent will actually have, have considered um ending their life rather than, than figuring things out. Um, so depression and anxiety is, is very high in this population. Um, support system um, is another key aspect. So what does support look like for you in your life? Because um, mm. it might not be family members. It might be um, a friend. It might be a cousin. It might be a colleague. It might not be anybody. And, um, you know, you might have to have those re resources ready at hand to say, well, let's let's find a support system for you. Have you, have you looked at some of the Fenway resources? The Fenway Institute is a great place to go for resources um, and connect into the, you know, the human rights campaign. They all are starting to, to join and get some mentors and some, some mm. people that help. Um, Hospital-based systems. Um, the, one of the biggest things with hospital-based systems is looking at your patient bill of rights. Um, if your patient bill of rights actually has that you cannot discriminate against, discriminate against patients and as, colleagues or employees, um, that shows that, that that particular system is very in tune with DE&I efforts and, mm -hmm. and, you know, treating the whole human, and uh, which also means that they have a lot of resources readily available for, for these kinds of um, spectrum uh, things that come on. Um, you know, oftentimes there's a high amount of, of alcoholism and uh, drug abuse. Um, there is a higher amount of smoking, um, mostly because there's a, a lot of body images associated with, with it as well. Oh. Um, if, if they're, is, if they're uh, in a, a gender affirming care, um, you need to know what hormones they might be taking or where in the transition they are. Yeah, talk to me about that because I, there, our hospital does provide gender affirmation care. Mm -hmm. and, and so I'm familiar with a, a lot of things related to that. But not as much, I think in the emergency department where I could see this being an issue are people who are doing things to um, improve their body image issues 
or not issues, mm -hmm. issues is the wrong word, but their self-perception so that yep. they can present how they feel. And you, I've heard you talk about things like binding and things like that. And yep. I see a lot of patients who could have pain related to issues with that. So can you speak to some of those things that we might see in the ED that I think could potentially take a practitioner off guard or they might not be aware of? Yeah, it's actually a, a, a thing that still catches me off guard sometimes. Um, you know, I, uh, I, I listen to a lot of my pelvic health therapists and uh, and honestly, our, our oncology therapists that deal with a lot with breast cancer, because I learn a lot from them about some of the techniques that come with, with binding and tucking. Um, there's a financial impact with, with choosing to, to do, um, you know, make some decisions on self uh, perception and making you feel more true to yourself. And um, it can come in the forms of taking duct tape and, you know, trying to reduce and minimize breast tissue by, by taking duct tape. So now, on top of lack of scapulothoracic rhythm, because the scapulas can't move anymore, there's T-spine issues. Um, you now have skin integrity breakdown issues that you now have to counsel this individual on. And binding can actually increase the amount of uh, intra-abdominal pressure. So it puts mm. a lot of pressure on the, on the diaphragm. And we know when you squish down on the top of the cereal box, what happens to the bottom of the cereal box? The pelvic floor starts to become more leaky as well, um, which means that everything else starts to not be able to fire as well, right? So yes. now you get back extensor issues, you get oblique issues, your transverse abdominus isn't able to activate as well. Um, and chest you know, wall pain. Yeah, chest wall pain. Is, is Which is a huge effort. diagnosis in the ED. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. people come to the ED for chest pain very mm -hmm. regularly, and often it's musculoskeletal chest wall pain. Mm -hmm. So uh, I could just see this being, being an yeah. issue for a patient. Yeah. And you might need to counsel them on the amount of time that they're, they're binding. Um, okay. So, so never tell them not to bind, right? Sure. That's, okay. that's like 101, right? Don't tell them not to bind. Um, but tell them that there's, there's a length of time that might be considered. So face to face, we, we tend to spend more time about eight to 10 hours of time face to face with individuals. The rest of the time is at home, right? You walk home and the first thing you do is you put your pajama bottoms on because you want to get out of your jeans, right? You know? Yeah. <laughs> um, jeans are fancy it, pants. If we have to wear jeans, we're not going. <laughs> I mean, but it, especially if you're a hospital-based uh, uh, ED PT, you get to wear scrubs for for the for your interaction. We're living in pajamas and yoga pants, and if you can't, you can't go. We just can't go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's what we tend to, to say is, you know, I'm never going to tell you not to tuck or bind in this case. Um, what I am going to tell you is you might want to limit the amount of time. So if you are going to see pay people all day long because you're going to work, that's fine. But as soon as you get home, take the binding off. Um, don't use duct tape. Like you're better off using double up on sports bras. Um, it, Amazon, you know, we can, we can, this is not a, pitch for Amazon, but people could buy things on Amazon and get it delivered to them. Um, you know, and there are, t there are binders that are for sale on Amazon and they're not that expensive too. So giving alternatives is, is definitely huge. Skin integrity is huge. There's no literature that suggests how much time, right? So there's nothing that says that the sweet spot is only 10 hours and that the rest of the time it needs to be off. Um, but you could start having those conversations of saying, we'll start with eight to 10, see if your chest pain improves. Um, if it does, then, okay, we'll, we'll stay there and, and, you know, and we'll start to figure out the type of binder that you're using. Um, we actually had one patient one time that was being misdiagnosed with carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, and it was actually because their binder was so compressive on their mm. brachial plexus that they were misdiagnosed as carpal tunnel and they were getting ready to have the surgery. And we actually were the first ones that had that conversation to say, um, you know, they approached us and said they, them. Um, so, cause I approached them and said what my pronouns were. So now we have this rapport. Um, and I asked the question, I said, do you bind? And, and they were like, yes. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to ask you to take the binder off. And let's see if you're, if now your special tests are, are positive or negative. And so let's see if that sensitivity and specificity changes a little bit. Um, and their symptoms resolved. Um, so now we saved them money from surgical intervention from a carpal tunnel. Um, and now we're able to counsel them. And now guess what? If they come back for another injury, they're going to come back to us because we gave them value centered care. Yeah. And, and I'm assuming that just opens up another layer of issues for this patient though, if the binder is no longer providing is causing harm and not able to, mm -hmm. to give them the benefit that they're looking for as well. Yeah. Yeah. And they might be at a different phase of their transition. You know, they might be waiting for approval for a breast reduction surgery. They mm -hmm. might not even want a breast reduction surgery. Um, and so being creative in those conversations and saying, okay, well, when do you, when do you face society the most? 
you know, is it Monday through Friday? Is it Monday and Wednesday? Are there opportunities that we can take the binder off during the weekend and allow for? Is there a community that you feel safer not wearing the binder um, around for, for as long of a time frame? And, and it's not permanent, it's not forever, but let's see if we can taper you back into, into wearing that. Okay, that's good to know. Okay. Yeah. Tucking is a whole other thing. Um, and uh, there are underwear specific to tucking that helps to support it. Um, what it is is they, the individuals will move the testes up and out, and then they'll take the penis and tuck it between the legs. And basically, their adductors and abductors are now firing pretty regularly to help maintain the penis in the position that they've now tucked it up into. Um, so that alone could be an issue is groin pain, okay. hip pain, glute, glute pain. Um, you know, if your glutes are always firing, you can sometimes get that piriformis uh, and sciatic symptoms down the leg. Um, and obviously it's going to disrupt a lot of that pelvic floor and pelvic yeah. Uh, health there. Yeah. Um, the other thing to be mindful of is testicular torsion, right? So what's our oh. autonomic dysreflexia, <clears throat> right? So, yeah. um, so best being mindful of having some of those conversations as well. And similar counseling techniques of um, you know, is there amount of times that you don't, you could, you could take a, a break from tucking um, that similar starting at that eight to 10 hours of, of that's your max and kind of tapering it to individuals from there um, can often seem to be a, a good starting point. That's all really helpful information. Now talk to me, what do we need to know about hormones? Because I think there are times when I look at people's medication lists mm -hmm. and I'm like, wow, I need to figure that out for a minute. Mm -hmm. And this adds another layer of complexity to that. So what are things, what are injuries or issues that people would be at risk of based on hormone therapies? Yeah, so this is another area in the literature that's a little bit lacking. Um, there's a, quite a few uh, multi-center <clears throat> studies that are starting to, to increase, uh, but your ACLs, your biceps ruptures, mm. um, those are oftentimes associated with, with hormone fluctuations in the body. Um, you know, with, with uh, hormone replacement therapies, uh, headaches, migraines can actually significantly increase in individuals that might not be either using the right one that, that would work for them or tapering it the correct way. Um, so that's, uh, you know, and how many times a day do you see somebody that comes in because of an intractable headache or migraine? Often pretty significant time. So knowing which hormones they're on um, it will be will be helpful. And and that doesn't mean that you have to know every single hormone. That means that you have to know when to call an endocrinologist and kind of have more of that conversation or, okay. or a neurologist and, and kind of say, hey, can you take a look at this med list and see if anything is really associated with, with increased migraines? Um, and, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of um, PCOS, so increase in PCOS mm -hmm. symptoms. Um, so a little bit more of that... Uh, abdominal bloating, irritable bowel that could be associated with the, with some of those hormone changes. Um, and uh, there's a higher, in, and there's an increase um, in um, ovarian cancer. Uh, they, the, the literature is starting to show that, um, especially on either side, whether you've had ovary, like an oophthalmy or, or had the ovaries removed yet or not. Um, but that, that can be an increase and breast cancer is an increase with hormone therapies. So those are good red flag things to consider when we're looking at people who might have metastatic issues as well. Right. Yeah. Your differentials need to be on high alert based off of those hormones. Okay. And then another thing that you and I have talked a little bit about is trauma-informed care. And so we just mm -hmm. recorded a whole episode on trauma-informed care, but I'd like to hear about it from your lens. And one of the things that I heard you say that's been most impactful to me is always assume trauma. So mm -hmm. talk to me about that and about consent and how we can make that safe space. I know safe space training <clears throat> is a whole thing and then we're not mm -hmm. going to get that in 10 minutes in a podcast, but what are some like basic things like that we can take into every patient encounter to make our patients feel safe and valued? Yeah. So always assume trauma is definitely one of my, my phrases that I, that I learned from trauma informed care myself. Um, and it really kind of raised, uh, you know, the hackles on the back of my neck for an example, or it's got the spidey sense going, um, because we are, as physical therapists, very good about saying, okay, I'm going to place my hands here, I'm, you know, but we don't always say, are you okay with me placing my hands here? Yeah, we're going to do that. Um, we're just going to do that. Just want to let you right. know, which is better than nothing, but is that the right. best we could do? 
Right. And, you know, and when I say trauma informed care, it's not always domestic violence. It's not always, you know, that that where there's a, been a physical abuse. But assuming that PTSD might come into play that I talked about the health disparities earlier in this podcast about, you know, that they might have gone two, three, four, five years with not ever seeing a provider. So you're evaluating a cervical spine issue. Um, you know, you're not going to come from behind and put your hands on somebody's neck, right? Especially if you're assuming trauma-informed care, you're going to say, okay, um, I need to talk some things out with you. I do need to do a clinical exam. If at any time something feels uncomfortable or you start to get anxious about where I am, please speak up. Um, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to place my hands on, on your neck. I'm going to keep my hands open so that it doesn't feel like I'm going to kind of close in on you. Um, I'm going to keep my hands open. I'm just going to feel around. I'm going to talk through the whole time and I need you to give me some feedback. And then you watch for some of those body cues, right? If you put your hands on somebody and they all of a sudden like just tense up, right? Uh -huh. Um, or they lean away from you, or, you know, you see goosebumps start to form on the, on the back of their neck, you, you need to stop and just say, okay, are you okay? Like, I could do some other things first. And I could look at, you know, some active range of motion first before I put my hands on you, so that we could develop this relationship a little bit more if, if that feels better for you. Um, and oftentimes, that is a good enough avenue to, to start to get people to, to decrease um, some of their, you know, guardedness. Um, and then just kind of get through as much as you can. You, you know, you should be able to get most of it from your your history with an individual. Um, but in the ED, you, do you really need to help diagnose and differential? And do you need imaging? Do you not need imaging? Like, let's see how long you're going to be here. And, and so you do need to get some of those palpations in. Um, but open hands, I'm going to do this. Are you okay with that? Um, and so just kind of having that, that continued to consent. So consent is is a continuous process. Correct, yeah. Not a like, hey, I'm going to examine you today. Okay, like that's insufficient. Right. We need right. to continually be asking for permission, assessing our patient's comfort with what we're doing, and readjusting our approach. Absolutely. And it has to happen every time, too. So don't just assume because they signed consent in the, you know, when they signed the paperwork away in the beginning, um, that they're consenting to everything that you need to do. That makes a lot of sense. And one thing I say to patients is, hey, like I need to do this exam and it may be uncomfortable, but what I need you to remember is that you're in charge. Mm -hmm. So if at any point you're like, nope, I'm done, that's mm -hmm. fine. And we'll have a conversation about it, but I will take my hands off of you and we'll stop what we're doing. Yep. No, that's a, that's a good approach. Okay. Now, my next question is probably an awkward question, but I want to know the best answer so that we can provide <laughs> better care. What do you do if you mess up? Apologize and get over yourself because it's your issue, not theirs. Um, okay. Yeah, the more you, the more you backpedal and, and apologize and over-apologize, the more that that trust level, that ability to, to repair the broken circle, that circle of security starts to increase and widen, right? So that trust level starts to lower itself down the more you apologize because now you're no longer making it about the patient. You're making it about your own mistake. And you're taking the focus off of them and onto you. And that's not the intent. The intent is even though you feel bad, the individual is now feeling more worse. And now this, this circle of security that you worked so hard to create is starting to break up even more and more. So apologize. You know, um, one of my phrases that I like to do is, you know what, I totally messed up there. What can I do to make you feel better and repair the relationship so that we can continue to move forward? Um, and most of the time, it's just, I appreciate your apology. Let's continue to get, to go through the exam and, you know, and, and we'll make, we'll just, we'll just get over it. Yeah. I think, I think I have a tendency to probably over apologize and make it about me because I feel <laughs> terrible. I'm like, I can't right. believe I just misused the wrong pronouns. I can't believe I yeah. called you the wrong name. Like, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to do that. Like, so I, that is very helpful because I think my tendency would probably be to be like, over apologizing and i find that we do that like from a customer mm -hmm. service perspective like yep. if if the waiter brings the wrong food and then they over apologize and they're like let me get you a free dessert let me do all these things like i think in our head that's the way that we should apologize but i think you're right it continues to draw attention to the fact that we are making this person different Right. And, and there's a, a key word and it's a blameless apology. Um, I recognize mm. that this wasn't the best situation for you, experience for you right now. Um, I'm going to do my best to continue to move forward. Please give me feedback. Um, and so 
there it is. It's a blameless apology. You know, I recognize that this was not a great experience in this moment. Um, I'm going to do better. Let's continue to partner together and how this, this can, this can be a better experience for you. I think that's very helpful. So if you were going into the emergency department and you were seeing things that were happening, so you're working in the ED Mm -hmm. and you're seeing providers, maybe not providing the best care. Uh, Mm -hmm. There's this concept of like being an upstander versus being a bystander. What are techniques you would suggest for someone like me who might see another provider treating a patient inappropriately in a way that doesn't upset the patient and doesn't escalate any issues between that other provider and that patient? Like how do we in the moment redirect everyone when it's not us? Yeah. So um, that's another situation where you can oftentimes say, um, you know, I recognize that you both seem to not be meshing in your interaction. Is there some way that I can help facilitate a better experience for both of you? Um, and usually that, that gives the provider a pause to go, uh-oh, something was just observed by my colleague that maybe I have my defenses up, maybe I'm not using appropriate language, but it also gives the the patient or the person that's receiving the care that way out of being like, oh my gosh, somebody else noticed that this is not a great interaction. Um, so, you know, hey, I recognize that this this experience seems to seems to not be optimizing the, the opportunities here. Is there something that I can help facilitate? You know, is there is there somebody I can help bring in? You know, is there another resource that you, you feel like you are missing that can help make this collaboration a little bit easier for both of you? Um, you know, that's when oftentimes what we can bring in some social workers and say, you know, some of our other other providers that may have had some training um, and just trying to, again, repair some of those those damages that might be happening on both sides of the coin. When, when you look at JAMA, JAMA put out an article uh, a few months ago um, that the average amount of education that providers, medical providers get is four hours during medical school. They don't even get exa- more in residency and fellowship um, nursing school gets probably about six hours uh, of care. And, you know, I know that uh, the our PT profession is starting to really integrate a lot more of this into, into our, our DPT programs and our PTA programs, which is great. Um, so sometimes just being that person that calls out that, that something seems uncomfortable is the best way without making it seem like you're taking over or attacking either side of the of the coin. I like that. So keeping everybody neutral, but facilitating a best interaction for everyone. Yeah. Yep. Okay. I love that. So parting thoughts. Yeah. If you're going to leave people who are practicing in the ED with like takeaway, what's the best thing they need to know about helping ensure we're not part of the problem? Yeah. So um, understand your own implicit biases. Mm. Start there, right? So turn your focus internally. What might I be laughing at at parties with friends? What might I be feeding into what might I, I look like in my social life because hmm. regardless of how much of how much we try to separate that those implicit biases will cascade into your ability to connect with patients so 100% call out your own implicit biases have some code words with some friends and colleagues that they can use to say hey Rebecca you might be using a little bit of a, of, of a implicit bias hey uh, hey um, basketball just basketball, like that's a usually a good keyword because now, mm-hmm. oh gosh, I, I have something going on. My face needs to be fixed because I have a little bit of a, a face that I know I'm wearing my emotions on. Um, so implicit bias training is, is definitely something. Introduction with pronouns, um, that's the number one thing that you can do regardless of sexual orientation or gender identity is just introducing every single person um, with your pronouns. You know, I, I'm Dr. Griffith, I prefer what are your pronouns? She, her? She, her. Perfect. There you go. Um, sometimes I like to use the joke of uh, um, what's chocolate's pronouns? Her, she. Her, she, right? Ah! So that, 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 a nice little, little little skill breaker for some colleagues, especially. Um, so um, that's the number, number two thing. And trauma-informed care. Um, under, you know, every patient, especially when they're coming into the emergency room, they probably have physical trauma, but always assume that there might be some mental trauma or or behavioral trauma that has has come with it. If you follow those three things, um, your empathy level will will significantly increase, your burnout level will decrease just because you are starting to recognize that you're approaching every individual as an individual um, and in a humanistic way. I don't think I have anything to add to that. That was amazing. 
Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. You're in the ED now and you're officially discharged. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening. In the ED Now is a podcast hosted and produced by Rebecca Griffith, the ED DPT, as part of Rebecca Griffith Physical Therapy, LLC. Our podcast makes you an excellent emergency department physical therapist. This podcast is intended for educational use only and is not intended as clinical or medical advice. While we make every effort for accuracy, factual errors may be present. Since you've been in the ED, I'm prepared to give you your discharge instructions. Please subscribe, share, and find more at the eddpt.com. You're officially discharged. Thank <laughs> you.